let's just go ahead and dig into this box. Now, one thing that I thought was really cool was I also have a little baggie that I think has all of these missing covers because these missing covers are always missing, never to be found again. So I have a bag that has, I don't know, probably eight different covers to the various little, little doors, the original power supply. original styrofoam in amazing condition and that is almost certainly the original plastic bag that this would have come in that's just amazing and power supply so good both power supplies now usually the way the other expansion that, that I have is um, the power supplies are like inside of it somewhere I don't know, it's a, it, I haven't taken that one apart. It has some issues. That was originally gonna be the topic of all my Septandi videos, is trying to get the other one working. There may be a bunch of that yet anyway, we'll see. So, that's interesting. I am quite sure that my other model one doesn't have the switches on it. The power switch, the various other connectors that all look exactly the same. Why would you do that, Tandy? Why? Um, but I know I don't have those switches, so that's interesting. There's obviously been some modifications there, and it looks like there's another little push button inside here that seems like an add-on. It looks like maybe a little bit got got carved out there. I don't know. I know I have the the cover for that. That's definitely one of the covers that I have. This is pretty dirty. It will it will use a nice cleaning. And you can see inside here. I don't know if it comes through on the camera. There's a big ribbon connector that goes from I believe a ROM chip over here to this chip connector over here. I think this is a basic upgrade. So while the box says level two, this has probably been upgraded to something else. So that will be, that will be interesting to see once we get that far. I'm gonna just move this stuff out of the way really quick. Now, let's see if I can get the monitor out of here. I heard you like boxes, so I put a box in your box, et cetera, et cetera. So, KTR-121S. It's basically the same thing on this side, but it also says video display. And what's going on in here? So, these must be the drive connectors. And the attachments on them are knit numbered. Zero, one, two. And there's no twists, so those other drives, as there's three of them, they must be jumpered somehow to identify them. I'll have to figure out 
which one is which so that they can get hooked up properly. before I can get that other loose bit out. Oh. All right. So let's look at this loose bit first. What is this? Expansion interface buffer. Oh, ho, ho. so the original expansion interfaces were very, very unreliable. People had lots of problems with them. One of the things that Tandy did to try to fix the reliability issues was add some buffering in the cable uh, between the, the computer end and the expansion interface end and that that supposedly made things better. I'm not super, super familiar with it, but this must be one of those little fix it things. And the other stuff that's in here <laughs> looks like an advert for a giant Texas Instruments calculator. Wow, that thing is a beast. It has so many keys on it. And then, oh, a letter dated April 15th, 1976, thanking the gentleman. <laughs> for inquiring about the SR60. All right, so that's interesting. And that appears to be the only other thing in the box. Okay, so there's the monitor. Wow, even from here, I can tell this has got a massive amount of burn in on it. Wow. But the weight distribution in these is so weird. It's like usually monitors seem like they're heavy up in the front and kind of towards the top. But this one, it feels like all the weight is right down in this corner. It's very, very unusual. Manufactured June 1978. I don't know that I've, <laughs> this has got to be an add-on that, okay, so what the person must have done, oh, that is so bad, is they must have modified it so that they could just plug in the monitor and then plug in the computer and the expansion interface to that, but this is bad, shame on you, because this isn't a grounded plug, <laughs> and these are grounded. That's just mean. That is shame. <laughs> I guess we can let it go. The mistakes of the 70s. And what are you going to do? So it will be interesting to see if any of this stuff actually works. We'll get to that next. So here I have set up both of my... TRS-80 Model 1 systems. The one on the right is the one that was uh, just unboxed, and this is the, the one that I already had. I thought it'd be interesting to look at the two systems and compare the similarities and differences. And right off the bat, there's one big difference between the two systems. This system has the numeric keypad, and this system does not. When the Model 1 was originally released, it had this keyboard, the level one basic ROM and 4K of RAM. Later, it was upgraded to have the extended keyboard with the, with the numeric keypad, the level two basic ROM, uh, which was needed for reading disks and doing a whole bunch of other things and just generally had a more capable basic implementation and had up to 16K of RAM. Now, there was kind of an in-between period, or it's my understanding anyway, where it was possible to order systems and sort of piecemeal upgrade them. Now, judging from 
the boxes and some other evidence by kind of peeking inside through the grill grates, this system has the uh, upgraded basic ROMs, the level two basic ROMs, and has 16K, or so the boxes proclaimed. But obviously it has the the older keyboard. Now, each one of those things was an additional cost to upgrade. I think the extended keyboard on itself was like $80. And, you know, in 1978 money, 80 bucks was, uh, was quite a bit. So I can, uh, I can definitely forgive a person for just, you know, give me more RAM, give me better basic, but, uh, you know, I don't need a numeric, numeric keypad. I can, I can totally live without it. And this system is, is definitely a later system. Um, I don't know if it says on the back any kind of manufacturing date codes. So this has a date on it that I'm assuming is from maybe service that says uh, May 14th, 1980. And on this one, on the monitor, we already established that the monitor at least was made in 1978. I don't know if there's anything educational on the bottom here. Nothing, but this is a pretty low serial number the, in the 13,000s. And this other one is 108,000. So definitely this one was manufactured quite a bit later. Um, and as I had previously mentioned, make sure I can get these positioned and try not to bang them together too much. Um, this one, uh, so, so this was the one I got originally that just has the regular power switch and, and IO ports here. And this one, uh, the, uh, the original owner of this one apparently went Han Solo on it and made some modifications himself as these two switches, which I have no idea what those will be for. Um, but other than that, they look pretty, pretty darn similar. So I'm going to reset here for a second, and then we can take a look at similarities and differences of the monitors um, and then the expansion bays. Well, I have them turned around this direction. This monitor, this is just some sort of like fairly thick piece of plastic that's printed on of wherever this was in service. Computer, computerized testing systems. I have no idea. Have no idea what that is. <laughs> uh, I expect with you know careful prying and the application of some heat, this could probably be removed. But sometimes stuff like that, I like to leave on systems just because it kind of it gives it a backstory of of some kind. It, it gives it some history, and sometimes that's interesting. So one thing to notice right away about these monitors, which are both very similar on the back, is they're just repurposed TVs. You can see here is a clip where an antenna would have been attached. So this is just a black and white TV that they stripped some stuff out of and said, yeah, it's a computer monitor. About the only difference that I see between these, aside from the manufacture dates, October 1979 versus June 78. So what a year and four months is the later model has some guards around these adjustment knobs on the back. Whereas the earlier model does not. Um, and then of course this one has the modification of the, the completely evil added power plugs. Um, but that's, that's not Tandy's doing. <laughs> And aside from that, and, you know, obvious different levels of cleanliness, um, they're pretty well identical. Here are the two expansion interfaces. 
Handy sold three different models of the expansion interface, and they differed only in the amount of RAM that came installed from the factory. The 261140 had 0K of RAM installed. The 261141 had 16, and the 261142 had 32K. With 32K in the expansion interface and 16K in the base system, that gave the Model 1 its maximum RAM expandability of 48K. These are both the 0K models. However, given the modifications that I've already seen on the other components that came with this unit, it won't surprise me if the previous owner added some RAM himself. They have the same set of expansions here, although this door, this cover is missing. I did previously say that these covers are always missing and they're just missing forever. So I'm surprised that this one is intact on here. Um, I'm not sure what each of these interfaces are. I'm expecting that one of them is the disk drive interface and the other one is perhaps the printer interface. So on the front, if I can turn this around without dropping it, is where the cable to the main system goes. There's another potentially removable door here. One of the many things that was irritating to people about the expansion interface is it's really annoying to press this the power button for it. Uh, Tandy recommended using a pencil or something like that to push it in. They intentionally made the power button recessed because you would typically have the computer sitting right in front of it and they didn't want people to bump the computer into it and accidentally turn this off while they were trying to do something. Uh, and then around the back. So around the back, um, two of these ports are for tape interfaces so that you could have two tape interfaces. I don't know what the third one is and I don't know what this cover is. I haven't looked that up. Now, you'll notice this has two power cords coming out of it and this has none. And this unit is quite heavy. So what people often did and there's screws here for this, is there's space in here for two of these power supplies. So what's happened with this one is the power supply for the main computer and the power supply for the expansion inter interface itself are inside here, but they're just two of these, these big bricks, which is why this one is very heavy at this end. And this one, weighs basically nothing and so what they've done is they've left the power brick in external and run the cord in here if it were me i probably would have put this one inside and left the one that goes for the main computer external but you know everyone has their own preferences Now, when I've previously tried to use this expansion unit, it didn't work. If I turned this on, the computer wouldn't power on and I got nothing. I have used that, uh, that other computer. One of the things that commonly goes wrong with these are, the whole interface here was just kind of a mess. This is a completely unshielded cable. It had all kinds of signaling problems. And apparently they used very crappy connectors inside here. Make sure that's in the camera. Inside here and on the edge computer, on the edge connector, pardon me, on the computer itself. So it's possible that all I need to do to get this to work is clean this and clean the edge connector on the other computer. Somewhere around here, I have the other cable interface for the other expansion interface that has the buffering. I am not sure where I put that. So I am going to momentarily pause the video and go find that. All 
Okay. So after having all the complaints about how terrible the unshielded, unbuffered interface cable was that originally came with these expansion interfaces, Tandy started shipping these as a an improvement. Um, reading things on the internet, it is not clear to me if these actually made anything better or if it just placated people. <laughs> uh, hopefully this, this will work out okay uh, with the interface that I have. It looks moderately grungy inside, so I'm definitely going to clean this out before actually connecting this up. So we'll, we'll see, and it's very dirty on the outside, so it, it definitely needs, need, needs some cleaning. Before I move on, to the part I think everyone's actually waiting for. I have one other piece of Model 1 kit. Many years ago, I found this, and I, I believe I found it at a Goodwill, and I saw it, I was like, okay, it's just an Atari joystick, but what the heck is this? And I asked a couple people around, and the consensus was it was a joystick for a Model 1. Now my guess is that it would connect to probably the printer interface port on the expansion bay, or maybe it could connect directly to the back of the Model 1 where the expansion interface cable would go. I don't know. So on here it says Alpha Stick 3, and then just the listing of the color of wires that are, that are connected, and then Rev one. So I have no actual idea what the heck this thing is, how software would interface with it or what software might use it. If you know anything about this device, please comment about it in the comment section below. I, I would love to learn. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna move all this around and I'm gonna restack everything up and I'm gonna I'm actually going to turn on the the new new model model one, and we'll we'll see if it works out. So I wasn't planning to do a cleaning montage or or anything, um, but I just wanted to show one thing really quick while I was cleaning inside here using a uh, for things like this where I can actually reach inside. I usually use something like a scrap of old t-shirt and just some some rubbing alcohol um, here is from the expansion interface in there like that came off cleaning just one side of the circuit connector where the the cable connects yuck <laughs> it's just it's just plain nasty i'm gonna go and finish cleaning the rest of it this surely would not have worked had I tried connecting it straight away. Hopefully, hopefully this cleaning will, will help improve the odds. Okay, so it's all put back together and hooked back up. Um, and I'm going to try just turning it on one component at a time and... Uh, We'll see what's hap what happens. Hopefully there won't be any smoke or fire or huge disasters. And uh, all right, well, let's just, uh, let's just do this. So monitor, okay, so the monitor lights up. That's a good sign. We've got brightness adjust, okay. And then we'll turn on the expansion oh that is there we go so that's on and it is super annoying to get in now on this end kind of hiding behind this door there's a switch that looks like a power switch but it's actually a reset switch so don't go pushing that thinking it's gonna turn the computer on because it won't it's just a reset button not that i know that from experience the actual power switch is over here next to the power cord one thing that people often complain about on these systems is the connector for the power cord, the monitor, and the tape. It's exactly the same kind of DIN connector. So you can plug anything into any of them and 
ruin everything. They're labeled. That's the only saving grace. So right now I have both of the magic switches switched up. Let's turn this on and see what happens. Well, that's, that's something. That's definitely more than my other Model 1 would get with the expansion turned on. So I'm going to turn this off and turn that off and see if it makes any difference with the expansion not enabled. Hey, hey, all right. So that means there's something wrong with the expansion. Who knows what? Radio Shack level two basic. All right, I will call that a win. I have no idea what these switches are for, but it works with both of them flipped up. Let's go ahead and turn this off and we'll see what happens with both of them down. All right, same, same thing. Okay, so wonder with that on and both down, maybe there's some kind of a disable for the expansion or, hmm. All right, same, same garbled screen. All right, so I'm gonna end this video here. In the next video, I'm gonna take this apart and try to figure out what these switches are for. And I'm gonna try to uh, troubleshoot this expansion. I'm also going to try using this connector with the other expansion interface and the other model one that I have just to see if the problems I was having with that one are, are just cable issues. There's a bunch of stuff to try, but I'm going to call this a, well, not this. <laughs> I'm going to call this a resounding success. So, until next time, which hopefully won't be too long, I'm going to try to get another video out maybe next week. We'll see how it goes. But until next time, try to remember the good stuff.